Hi, everybody, and welcome to Music Career Radio. I'm your host, Nani Noam Vazana, and my guest this week is Diana Ezerens, the Director of Public Programming for the Kennedy Center of the Performing Arts in Washington, D.C., USA. Together, we will explore ways for independent musicians to collaborate with presenters, institutions, and festivals while showing how to be a part of their program. As you know, all work in this podcast is done voluntarily, and we also collect donations for scholarships for independent musicians. So if you want to support us, and you should, because we do a lot of work to help up uh, up-and-coming artists, uh, please visit ydiymusic.com slash donate and support us and many musicians that deserve a better education. You could also send a direct PayPal transfer to paypal.me slash noamvazana. Welcome, Diana. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm well. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much for coming. It's been a while since we met. It has indeed. Uh, almost, I guess, eight months at this point. December? Yeah. Six months? No yeah. Yeah, November, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It was a pleasure, by the way, to perform at the Millennium Stage. So thanks so much for inviting oh, me. It is our pleasure. It's really cool. Actually, you know, when we met at Womix, I had um, this feeling about you. Like we had this dinner with some colleagues. You remember at the Korean restaurant? I do and remember. What struck me most, <laughs> what struck me most about you is um, that you don't tolerate uh, bullshit. <laughs> and being someone that, <laughs> yeah, that is know. kind of the same. <laughs> Because we, remember, there was, there was this guy that was uh, at our table and was kind of boasting about what he does. And you called him on it. And I was thinking like, hmm, I thought to myself, maybe I have a new friend here. You know, like, uh, yeah, that was fun. <laughs> yeah, I definitely do remember that. I mean, yeah. in those kinds of atmosphere, I just come to expect that everyone is someone that is doing great work. And I'm curious about them and what they're doing. But when people become too boastful or look at me, I don't know. It makes me skeptical about their work. Yeah. I totally agree with you. It's kind of, you know, if you're being the peacock, you're probably a mouse. So uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But hey, we don't let that interrupt uh, so much our work here. And I really like your work for the Millennium Stage. Um, it's uh, I like the idea that it's rooted in diversity and that the audience development is strong, you know, in the concept. Um, you kind of expose new audiences to new cultures and music that they usually don't uh, get exposed to. So I was wondering, what's your position? Uh, if you could tell me more about your programmer audience relationship and the, and the concept of the Millennium Stage in general. Sure. So... Uh, my position is the Director of Public Programs at the Kennedy Center. I oversee Millennium Stage, which is our daily free performance series, um, but we also are responsible for a number of different festivals and supporting all projects that the Kennedy Center takes on and ensuring that they adhere to um, elevating artists that maybe are not typically presented at the Kennedy Center. Um, it was mm -hmm. an organization that was founded to showcase and uh, preserve historical culture, white culture traditionally, Western European type of art forms, um, and Western classical, uh, Western European classical art forms. So uh, it ended up excluding a lot, uh, pretty much everything, except for that one particular audience. Um, it's evolved over time, certainly, but there's still a tremendous amount of work to be done to make sure that we are um, celebrating, showcasing, preserving all the art that makes up our culture. And of course, in America, it is everything. And so um, we want to exemplify that and to be um, a welcoming space for voices from around the globe. So, um, and that comes through in all of our work, um, whether it's one of our festivals or if we're in a pandemic and we're trying to do a lot of online content, um, whatever it may be, we are trying to, you know, balance out whose voice is heard and how we do it. Awesome. When did it start, the Millennium Stage? The Millennium Stage is 23 years. Uh, it started in 97, 1997. 
Um, we started streaming and archiving online through YouTube um, and our website um, in 1999, I believe, 2000, like right at the beginning of YouTube, we went straight to it. We were like the first performing arts center to uh, start streaming and archiving all of our performances. Um, obviously, I don't know. I mean, we haven't been able to perform or host audiences in the past, like since March. So um, this is the first time we've had yeah. a break like this. First time anyone's had a break like this in over 100 years. And uh, yeah, 20, 20, almost 25 years. Really nice. It's really, it's amazing for me to see that you still keep on programming while the Corona pandemic is uh, on and full blown because you did this house uh, concert series I saw on social media. And I like that you brought together musicians that otherwise wouldn't be able to collaborate in real life. So you kind of put the focus on making the impossible possible rather than trying to make something local and you know, you know what I mean, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. The the pandemic was an opportunity. Well, immediately as soon as the pandemic hit, we knew that we needed to find a way to to have performances of some sort. Um, digital is obvious, um, and we already have a built-in audience for a digital performance series because of the Millennium Stage. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, yeah. we recognized that artists have no performance venue anymore. Like both their income and their there's their space for expression were both taken away, and so. Uh, we wanted to try and figure out a way for there to still be a connection between an audience and the artist um, in an authentic way. Um, and it is, you know, a unique circumstance. I think we're all very excited about live music and performances being possible again. We still don't really have an end in sight at this point, at least in the United States. Uh, we're probably going to be on lockdown for at least another six months. Who knows? Um, so, yeah. Uh, we had to pivot immediately and try to find a way to give the audience and the artists uh, an opportunity to connect. It's the same situation here. I mean, I was supposed to be on, on tour now with 88 concerts worldwide, but they're all canceled. Only five yeah. of them survived the pandemic regulations, actually. And three cool. of them already happened. So like in the next few months, I, I'm still going to have two. And they're both, one of them is in September and one of them is in December. So it's like, as far as audience uh, relationship, it's not really being developed one-on-one -on -one as it was before. Mm -hmm. And as far as income, I mean, it's a, of course, it's a disaster because, you know, there's nothing uh, coming in in comparison to what we were supposed to make. So, um, yeah. Are you going to continue your series? Are you, are you, are you going to do other things? Yeah. So we received, so... Um, part of my focus with these, we did these couch concerts is what we call them, Kennedy Center couch concerts, mm -hmm. alliteration. Uh, we did them three times a week. And on Mondays, we focused on a national spotlight where we worked with performing arts venues around the country and asked them to curate the artists from their communities um, so that they mm -hmm. are, you know, speaking to how the circumstances, either because of um, the pandemic or because of the racial injustice and oppression that we're starting to address um, we wanted them to identify the artists who would best reflect on those circumstances. Um, and so Facebook did um, catch wind of it and they gave us a small amount of money to keep them going. Uh, yeah. And so we're going to evolve from the three days a week to five days a week starting the last week of July, uh, Monday through Friday. And they'll be in every state, every territory, as well as um, DC and Kennedy Center programming. So yeah, it is going to continue. Great. Yeah. So but what about you? you? I know this is about me, but I want to know about you because you have never sat still this long, probably in your entire oh, life. God. What are you doing? How I'm are you surviving? So... I'm going crazy. So that's why I'm making all these online programming for myself. <laughs> so I have this series. I'm doing making this podcast uh, about outreach for uh, independent musicians. So connecting industry people and uh, independent musicians like we do now and I'm broadcasting uh, live concerts online once a week so at the beginning of the pandemic I had done it for 10 weeks for free completely voluntarily just to make it accessible for people and now we uh, it, so we collected some donations but it was really close to zero and just last last Sunday was the first paid event um, wow. and I was actually surprised that we had uh, a lot of people coming at the beginning we thought we we're not going to have a lot of people uh, but in the last two days, like 10 times the audience bought tickets last minute. So we were like, whoa, overwhelmed. Super happy too. 
Yeah. I met a lot of people from the US, which That's is great. Uh, very interesting for me to see. Also, if you look at my web store, like about 70% of the sales on my, se on my web store is from the US, which is insane because I only toured there three times. Well, clearly you need to come back yeah. once it's safe again. Yeah, I want to. I have some good friends I want to visit too. Yeah. And a good uncle that uh, you met, by the way. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so there's that. And uh, I've started doing hosting gigs and voiceover gigs as well. So like uh, I have this home studio set up and I'm producing infomercials and um, voiceover. I did an audio book for Robert Frost poetry. <laughs> when is the cartoon coming? There's a lot going on. Sorry? I, when is the cartoon coming? Oh, I would love to do that. You it's my dream it. to dab animation. You would be a good cartoon voice. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Daddy, go, let's do it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> first step radio. If somebody is watching, please uh, let me know. <laughs> um, no. Well, I mean, like, I really, I'm really not used to it that my guests are asking me questions, but I love it. Please, <laughs> please do go on. <laughs> Um, you already brought me actually to my next question because you um, you were talking about the racial injustice before, mm -hmm. and I saw on your social media that you re recently launched the Black Culture Matters Initiative, mm -hmm. and I'm very curious about your goals for this project because it seems to me, especially that DC is such an important hub at the moment with uh, the recent backdrop of you know s social awareness, let's say, and you are my source from within, so uh, please. Could you elaborate more about your experience in the last month and uh, what conclusions did you have or maybe you would establish with while looking towards the future? Well, I started to participate in the protests pretty much immediately. Um, it was hard. To, I mean, it was hard to sit back, even though we're in the middle of a pandemic and watch a city burn, like literally burn. Um, and I don't know that if there hadn't been a pandemic, if we had we would have united in this kind of way um everyone's been separated everyone's been glued to their tv or to their computer to twitter um so there was no escaping watching the video of the death of george floyd there's no escaping the fact oh that God. like brianna taylor still there still has not been justice yeah. for her or and you know like on and on and it if, yeah. i don't think for anyone like th this is nothing new. Certainly for me, it's nothing. It's not something that I haven't been focused my work on. I mean, pretty much the the entire history of my time with Millennium Stage and with the Kennedy Center, we've been working towards changing the institution and what is accepted as classic and culture and what should be celebrated as American heritage, um, mm -hmm. and uh, giving a platform to oppressed voices who have been historically oppressed, who are who are oppressed. Um, so. It is like one in the same, like I, my work and what I believe are, are one in the same. And so I, I participated in a lot of the protests, which I don't know what they show you over there, but at least in DC, we all had masks on. We kept our distance from each other. There were some times where we were a little bit closer than we probably should have been. And we certainly were, you know, participating in the chants, um, but knock on wood, they haven't shown that these I think really because we had our masks on I think that and it was outside so I think the combination of those two things kept us like knock on wood the universe kept us pretty safe um yeah. so in terms of like what's what it's been like physically like it's per, it's been pretty exciting to see the groundswell like one, during one of the protests it marched from the White House all the way up to the northeastern portion of DC and it was mm -hmm. run by, um, like, it was kind of loosely associated with, like, Pride was supposed to happen that weekend, so there were people that were already participating in Pride activities that were kind of running. Like, there was a guy who was uh, heavily involved in house music in D.C., Black, he's a, uh, it's Black house music, and house music came from Black communities. Um, so we had mm -hmm. Black house music from D.C. marching us all the way up the street. It was, like, almost like a, a party, but it was serious, like, and we collected people along the way uh i don't know like it feels awkward to say that it was fun but it was like 
it was very DC in that like DC is a very progressive city. Like people who live here care very much, are carry very deeply. Like it was the area that had the least, it was like 1% of the population voted for Trump. Everyone else, you know, like it's very liberal, you know, and yeah. focused heavily on rights and injustice and all of that stuff. So um, it's yeah. been pretty exciting to see people activated. And as we were marching, there was a lot of, like there's a lot of his, they used to call DC Chocolate City because it was a historically black city. Um, and there's a lot of families that have lived there for many generations. And so we're like marching up the street and like all these older, like native Washingtonians are coming out and they're like cheering for us. And some of them are like kind of crying because it like, as I've been told, like, unlike in the past, which I've, I've protested many times, you know, since I've lived here over the deaths of other black men, typically, uh, as well as other issues, but like, there's a lot of white people that are getting their act together and are participating in ways that hasn't really been seen before. And I think are understanding the issues and trying to learn about whatever their privilege and how the oppression has benefited them and how the, the repercussions of how slavery, the repercussions of slavery still exist today. Um, so. Right, not that far away. Yeah, you know, so that's been, um, it's been good to see. I think we're making progress. I can only hope that we're making progress because otherwise, what is there, you know? Uh, so that's how it is like societally and how I have been experiencing the racial justice movement. Uh, as it relates to Black Culture Matters, the Kennedy Center initiative, um, it is part of the department I am in called Social Impact uh, for the Kennedy Center. Mm -hmm. um, it is, a, there's eight different sectors of focus. Um, so one of them is this Arts Across America program that I'll be overseeing Black Culture Matters. We have an expansion that just opened last year and we'll be uh, uh, creating a lot of programming in those new spaces um, that mm -hmm. will be focused on art for non-art outcomes, so art for social justice outcomes, and uh, okay. activating and organizing um, different groups who- With focus on communal projects, or? Yeah, so it's like organizations that focus on health, or voting rights, or uh, like women's rights, migrant and refugee issues, um, so identifying the organizations that are doing that work and then creating cultural experiences that support and surround those organizations. So as opposed to taking the artist out and just presenting the artist itself, like what is a more, uh, what is a more in-depth experience look like with any of those different organizations and the communities they represent? Awesome. Yeah. Super important stuff, man. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. I mean... Otherwise, what's the point of art? Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, you know, like what Nina Simone said, that the, the artist has to reflect their times and uh, the time that you're living in. And if you don't do that, like, what is your point of voicing what your thoughts are and what your, what your emotions are? I mean, like, I could cry about my love life, you know, and I could also sit at home and- That's universal. Of course, everybody will have the same experience. It's universal, everybody will have the same experience. But um, if I'm talking about a specific culture or a specific struggle, then I'm making it personal and maybe also uh, a possible breakthrough for other people, not only myself. So it's not only about being selfish as an artist, but also about seeing how you can create a bit bigger scope for your work and mm -hmm. affect other people as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We should talk about that uh, yeah, more thoroughly after we finish the conversation. Yeah. 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 yeah, I would like that. I yeah. was, um, you know, this podcast is also about uh, connecting programmers and uh, independent musicians. And I wanted to ask you about your experience working with independent musicians, uh, specifically about um, what is the difference uh, between working with a musician directly and, and working with an agent or with a manager? Do you have any preference or do you see any... Um, uh, better strategies on one side or the other? Well, the work of my department and area of the Kennedy Center is so focused on like social justice issues and uh, moving the needle in terms of like intercultural understanding and understanding that like accepting multiple perspectives, you know? Um, so yeah. I tend to, while I do work with artists 
independently or even through their agents, it's not the bulk of our work. It it accentuates mm-hmm. the work. So if they're if I don't have many like Muslim artists or Latino Latin X artists or whatever, like it, it's helpful to know mm-hmm. who's out there who can help populate like making sure that I'm each month showcases as many different voices and communities as possible. Um, but mm-hmm. for me, the best thing, what benefits our work best is when we're identifying artists who really stand for a cause and stand for a change mm-hmm. that needs to happen in society or raising awareness about a certain community's experiences. Um, and so then like, mm-hmm. there's no way you can get to through an agent to an artist to have those conversations that lead to something yeah. more deep, you know, like you want to be able to have conversations with artists so that, they're like, this is like, uh, for a lot of performers, what's on stage is only like a small fraction of who they are as an individual. And what we want to do is elevate the individual as a whole. We don't want to separate out the artistic aspect. We care about, we want to care about what they care about. And we want to make our audiences care about what they care about. So um, having like the whole person represented as opposed to just like, I performed at the Kennedy Center and Lincoln Center. And like, that makes me so good. Like, for me, that doesn't impress me much. Like, I don't care where else you've played. I don't care if you've sold however many identifying artists so that they're speaking toward, speaking to their whole self and reflecting on their communities and their unique experiences is way more important to me than, like, where they played, if they've got a Grammy or if they were nominated for a Grammy or, like, whatever else, Mm -hmm. you know. So. Yeah. So it's more about the work that they do with their art to elevate a certain message. Um, but I was really wondering about your communication because you said that the communication with the artist is important for you. It's crucial for your work. So maybe you can elaborate a little bit about more uh, how, why, why is it important for you to speak with the artist directly and not to overbridge through an agent, for instance? Because an agent is just looking to get, you know, they have a lot of artists that they represent and they have a small amount of time. So the only thing that they think about is like how much money and what's the visibility. That's it. Like the like and not everybody is like that. There are a couple managers off the top of my head that are definitely not like that. They definitely understand the artist as a whole and look for unique opportunities for that artist to be presented as their whole self. Meaning mm-hmm. how they grew up, the neighborhoods they grew up in and what change they want to make in, in the world. Um and those are the people that we want to build projects with we want to it's not just about the show sometimes it is maybe Mm -hmm. like but for me those are like the filler dates i'm more looking for the artists that are really trying to do something not just become famous not just like have more people buy their records uh and that tends to Mm -hmm. there's a there's a number of artists who maybe used to play the kennedy center a lot more i mean i've been doing what i do for a number of years but there are some that think it's like they're right. Yeah, that and also like, we wanna find the things that are more unique. I mean, you can, if you're a singer songwriter that's like trying to be a famous singer songwriter, like country Western, let's say, kind of songwriting, right? Mm-hmm. Like for for the United States, there's plenty of places where you can play any bar pretty much and you can develop your work, you can develop like how you relate to an audience but is that really unique for like me, for what I do at the Kennedy Center? No, I'm sorry mm-hmm. to say it's not. And actually, if you, yeah, you know, I like there's lots of them, like that's not. But if you're like, like a Native American artist who is utilizing various popular forms of music to have to tell your story about what's happening within your community, like or about all the horrific things that has happened to your communities over hundreds of years or tell the inspiring message of thinking about seven generations ahead and seven generations behind and how you Mm -hmm. want to use your message to think about. Um, I see a lot of musicians that seek mentoring sessions with me. uh, And one of the things that they have the most difficult with difficulty with is understanding the programmers side of the business. It seems to me that most artists focus on getting the highest number of gigs based on their own music rather than showing how they can be or become a part of a festival or a series program. Uh, what is your advice for musicians who struggle with this aspect? How can they show the programmer that they can grow together with them? 
I'm a different type of programmer. I'm not looking for people who have the most followers or the most views, though. I'm looking for artists that will help us tell a specific story. And I think a lot of I think a lot of festivals operate similarly, especially with artists that we're, we're probably reaching, younger artists that are, or artists that are in development. I think something that's really important that a lot of artists don't want to focus on is like what makes them unique. And that requires them becoming vulnerable with the story that they want to tell. And sometimes their music isn't evolved enough for that. And I'm, that it just means that you either have to dig deeper and think about that, or maybe it's not your game. I'm not saying don't stop playing, but it would, I think it would, but I'm in the States. I don't know. I have a lot of musicians from here that go to Europe and have a fine time, but they, but those artists tend to be ones that already kind of have momentum going for themselves. Um, yeah. Yeah. I guess that's my advice is to, they really need to figure out what their mission is. Like, you can't just be like, I want to be a star or whatever. Um, but because what, what people identify with is the story of the artist, you know, like, yeah, it's as simple as that. So a lot with your ambition, you know, if have, if you have an, an distinctive ambition or is this just the general thing? Because a lot of the musicians that come to me for counseling, they say, I want to make great music that will touch people. But what is the story? What is going to touch people? So that for me, that is missing a lot of the time. And I think, especially in your field, if you are um, connecting with very specific stories that try to elevate certain communities or a certain narrative, then this is super important, especially in your uh, when working with a programmer like you to try and uh, emphasis that in your work and also show how you can be a part of your program because you're bringing something that supports your agenda in that case. Yeah, I just I think a lot of artists, I mean, it hurts to go. I mean, I think I think one of the reasons artists that are especially you know, there's a lot of um, trauma in a lot of the artists that become more successful. But I think a lot of that is because they can go deep into their trauma to like, that is what drives their work. Almost like it's another being like, it's almost another person that ends up writing whatever the thing is, you know, and when they're on stage performing it, they're embracing whatever drove them to, to that. And that sometimes means that they also have demons tied to it. But I think one of the reasons they become famous is because they can tap into that emotion with less fear, maybe, or maybe it's just out of necessity, a lot of times of survival to get that story out. Um, but I think artists really need to go there. And like, you, like love you brought up earlier, heartbreak is super like universal, but also unique. And like, there's a reason so many songs are about breakups and that's because they're really painful. And so you have to go to something to release that pain, but you can't always rely on like the bad things in life to get you there. Like some, there's other vulnerabilities that can be exposed, but sure. yeah. So I think, I think embracing that is, is the, like, that's the driver to make people connect with you. You know, I think if, if I look at the beginning of my career, I also had the belief that uh, I had to suffer to make good art. And I don't have that belief anymore. Like I was waiting to have something horrible happen to me so I can write an interesting song. But and now it's actually to the contrary. I need to feel content and happy with what I do to be able to write a good song because I can now I can and um, associations that brings me um, forward, I guess, as an artist. And then another thing is not to always be writing for someone else because I think a lot of artists are trying to write songs that are catchy or songs that will communicate better with the audience rather than writing what they really like and um you know you, you look you look at artists like nick drake for instance he's a singer songwriter but he's a very different singer songwriter and if you write something like that of course there won't be a huge audience but especially today with the internet and everything the 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 smaller your micro niche is the bigger your audience will be and you can define it and you can reach all these people and you couldn't before. So I think this is a great time. It's an opportunity to, especially now during the Corona, you know, because I was kind of focusing on getting gigs before because I love performing and it's really a part of me as a, as a, as an artist and as an, as a person. But now I have the opportunity to invest in my online fan base 
which I kind of neglected in the last five years or so. So Hi, now I'm learning to get to know a lot of interesting people and I have even a subscribers group that they support me monthly. And it's like an amazing experience that I wouldn't have experienced if I didn't have the pandemic. Yeah. Sometimes the limitation also brings you to a good place. Yeah, exactly. That's great. Mm -hmm. Depends how you roll with it. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that. I mean, we reacted quickly and I'm glad it, left, it worked out and was well received. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, to me, it was, it was so obvious a way to respond because we already did have like an audience online that looked to us for content. So I knew that it was there and that it was needed and I knew the artists needed an outlet. Um, but yeah, I mean, this situation is what it is. We've got to make the best of it. You're an interesting person. You're an interesting person. Yay. <laughs> we like each other. One of the biggest uh, struggles of the music industry, I think, is gender balance. Uh, two months ago, I had a pleasure of interviewing Vanessa Reed, and you probably know her. She's the CEO of New Music US, mm. and she's also a game changer in the field because she started the uh, Key Change Pledge in the UK and then mm. became like a European festival pledge for 50-50 gender balance in programming in festivals. And um, it still strikes me that today, let's say I'm going to a venue uh, and I'm entering um, the, the place, let's say, with my husband or whatever, a friend uh, helps me out carrying the stuff. And then they would not address me. They would address him and start asking him questions about the stage plot. So then he would refer them to me. And in return, uh, they would you know they would be they would be wondering okay oh she's the musician okay so let's ask her are you the vocalist when is the trombone player and the pianist coming <laughs> so oh, like, then i have to explain scary. no i'm playing all the instruments myself yeah um yeah and also you know in conferences you know the the this like the circle that we're standing and we're introducing uh, ourselves to each other and they kind of skip you because you're the only female in the group and you yeah, have to kind of force yourself into the introduction. Uh, so these things happen all the time. And I was wondering, first of all, as a female programmer, uh, do you have an experience uh, uh, discrimination because you're a female programmer? And also what is your agenda in terms of gender balance in your programming? Well, the first, que that second question is probably easier than the other. I'm always looking for female voices. Um, on my call earlier, we were talking about Louisiana music and I noted, I was like, I'm glad that you're showing so many females here because there's so many artists that get overlooked. Or they just don't get presented as often yeah. because uh, they're female. Or And some people might not even think about it. Sometimes it's like other even women curators that um, don't keep that balance in mind. And hmm. I don't know, I guess it's just how our society has evolved, I guess, in some ways. Like you, I mean, I've, hmm. I guess, let's see. I can't really think of too many. Okay, so another way of thinking, I, I've been thinking about this lately is in terms of like, the, I mean, I don't know. Like, yeah, the gender balance is a, is a tremendous issue, but it, it goes so much deeper than just like, why aren't there more musicians? You know, it's such a boys club. And if you mm -hmm. rub any person, like if you're in a band and it's coming up or whatever, like my friends and I were talking about a band called The Recess the other day. They're like, yeah, but this band has gone through like three, four different female vocalists and it's entirely because the lead dude like misuses the women in the band and for whatever oh. reason, either they get fed up and leave or whatever. And yeah, like it's in every single track of music. Uh, so I definitely try to look out for the women who are in those various fields and try to uplift that and make sure that we're showcasing them. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what the balance is in my programming, but I would, I would bet that it's pretty good, but it's still not as good as it could be because at every level on up, like, I guess basically as soon as like girls start having boobs and guys start knowing their bodies or whatever, that's probably when the the imbalance starts to happen. I'm sure it's a ripple effect mm -hmm. when our home hormones take over or whatever. And also just like, again, like I think about trauma a lot. And if like, 
let's say America, like if America was founded on trauma, then that trauma carries down and it like shows up, shows up in all kinds of ways. And we've learned to, or people maybe have learned to accept it because that's all they've seen and they don't question like, you know, you're a girl. So you, like I was a percussionist, you know? And so it's fortunately, I don't, I was so much, honestly, I was so much better than the guys that they were, no, it wasn't even like, she's good for a girl. Like she kicks all of our butts. So like, okay, she's first chair or whatever. So, so how come we didn't play me? How come we didn't play with me at the show? Oh, I don't really play anymore. I mean, I wish that I did. One day, I probably will. I was mostly a marimba and vibraphone player, and fun. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, I could have played with you. I was, I don't know, I don't know why I didn't. Let's do a video. I'm shy. I'm shy. That's let's just say that. Do you have vibes? I no, know. I live in a tiny studio. My bed's like right behind me. You can see it. On. So <laughs> no, I don't have room for vibes or marimba, but one day when I'm older. I still have my mouths and my music. It's heavy and I don't know why I look it around, but yeah. But anyway, gender. Yeah. I do want to play. Yeah. But yeah, so gender. It it relates to so many deep issues. And there's so many levels where people can get turned off from continuing to pursue it. Like there's enough pressure on some any person, any musician to like be good. And if you have like the at like if I had the like the bad luck of having a terrible instructor like that would get on me about not being good enough and also was like or had yeah. hired staff like in high school marching band like there were definitely staff that hit on students you know college students that were hitting on high oh, school. yeah I, I know <laughs> from you know? first hand yeah so yeah, yeah. If you're if you have a band director who doesn't think about that stuff or like you know oh it's just guys being guys and they're not only telling you that you're not that great at it, but also, hey, I'll put you in whatever, you know, for favors or attention or whatever the thing is. Or like yeah. if they form a romantic attachment and he's giving her attention because he wants to get with her. And then after that happens and then he's mean to her or whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. hard. It, it's hard enough to go on without that. So, yeah. Yeah. There's lots of. I mean, I. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, no, I was just. Uh, I just wanted to say that I even get harassed sometimes in, you know, let's say, uh, trade fairs or events of, you know, music industry events. So people will come to me and say, "Hey, would you like to do this and that?" And I was like, "Yeah, sorry, I'm married." And they're like, "Yeah, but that doesn't matter. We can keep it a secret." You know, like then I tell you about the secret. And it's like, are you serious? And I had this meeting just before I met you, actually, like at Womax, uh, like two minutes before we met, had this meeting at a stand. You were coming over from another stand. And um, the guy was talking to me about my music. He wanted to showcase it in some kind of a showcase event in Asia. And uh, then let's say 10 minutes into the conversation, the next question is, so what do you think about infidelity? It's like what the hell is going I know on? Who you're talking about. It's, just, it's like they they don't even blink, you know. It's like I don't know how could you allow yourself to be so obnoxious. So, of course, you are not being taken seriously from this point on. People can call it whatever they want. Like in other cultures, in other cultures, misogyny is just accepted. Well, I don't care. Whatever. I'm. American and I don't accept misogyny in my life and maybe you can say that I'm a callous American or something if I reject your advances but I don't know I don't yeah. care but it, it but it's not my business like it you know I have a different kind of uh position I, I can definitely see and I know exactly who you're talking about but you also don't know if those people I thought, well, you probably also don't sorry, know if people can fulfill what they promise anyway and most of the time yeah. I'm not really sure that they can, so whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it, it kind of brings a, us to the first um, topic of our conversation, that if you boast too much, then it's probably nothing. Yep, yeah. exactly. Ah, and deliberately, I mean, like in this podcast, I uh, at the beginning when I started, I f thought that I wanted to do it 
really on a weekly basis and then do a female one week and a male one week or like you know alternate between male and female every week but yeah. that didn't like i did it pretty well for about two months and then i noticed that it doesn't work out because most males that i approach refuse to participate in the podcast so i actually have more females now and um it's funny that like the the answers that i get from them is like well sometimes they say i don't have time sometimes they say i would do it but later but then sometimes they say i'm attracted to you too much so i can't be on your podcast and it's like whoa are you serious that doesn't even pretend sense. to be normal for an hour and a half that is ridiculous yeah oh yeah well what can i say that's fine there's plenty of other people to interview exactly there's lots of interesting people there's a lot of other more interesting than you probably yeah 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 uh if we're already talking about trade fair events um mm -hmm. you meet a lot of musicians there i bet it's also so other programmers do you see any patterns or mistakes uh that musicians make when they're trying to approach uh well i would say you but you already said before that um that your um preference is actually to work is to work with the artists so then maybe it's not foreign to you uh but in my eyes uh one of the biggest problems uh, that that people try to network rather than make friends um what what is your view on this do you, do you experience that yeah the networking is a numbers game and it comes down to like what they perceive as being the person of importance so the people mm -hmm. like the dude that we were talking to i'm sure he has plenty of people coming up to him and that guy's probably dismissive and rude and whatever i feel bad for both parties because who's really being authentic in that point if if the person is looking to represent someone with the attitude and yeah. gravitas of their own then cool uh I guess like being curious about what people's goals are when it comes to presenting. I don't get asked a lot, a lot of questions about what I do and why. Uh, they care about where I'm from, they care about the Kennedy Center or whatever. Actually, and it, it really even depends on that. Like a lot of people don't even care about the Kennedy Center, which is fine. Um, but I think it's a great venue. Yeah, it is. But it's like, what is your institution or organization's relevance to your immediate audience, but also your global audience? And same goes for the artists. Like, what is their relevance to the people in their immediate communities or those globally? Like, why would they want to travel globally? What do they have to say? Um, so, yeah, I guess there's not, I don't see a lot of curiosity, but I think I often get glazed over because I am not an aggressive person. Like. I like to try kind of like float through and observe. And then if I like what I see or hear, then I will approach the artist and talk to them. But I don't see a lot of curiosity when people are like cold calling me or whatever, even like emails at the Kennedy center, like people just send me like the same copy and pasted thing. And they have no idea. Like they'll ask yeah. me about like, can we put this on your season next year? And I'm like, well, if you even, knew who you were emailing or even looked up my name somewhere you could see that i oversee yeah. a program that's every single day so there is no season like yeah that should like but i mean I, i understand that people don't have a lot of time but if you want a job then if i want a job or whatever like i'll find oh. out what the organization is about and then make my design my letter accordingly like you're not going to sure. just like send one mass email to 100 people and hope something bites you have to care about them as much as you care about your own gigs. I think you should really listen and do your research in advance. And of course, when you meet a person, even if you don't know what they do, ask them. Yeah. You know, try to find out during during a conversation how you could fit into their world rather than they fitting into your world. Because totally. I think that's what what most musicians do. It's like you um, have to be flexible for me because yeah. I'm great. Because I'm, I play unique music. You need that in your program, right? But it's, I think it's really more about collaboration and things that evolve um, naturally. Sometimes I have also more wavelength because they will survive longer. 
like I did this gig. It was a very random small gig for, you know, so far this, uh, um, kind of house concert uh, yeah, yeah. organization. I, know so far. I had a gig at the Manchester jazz festival hmm. and they, they wanted to do a promotional gig. So they collaborated with so far and they invited me to do a gig to that purpose, to launch the program at the festival. And uh, we did it in a Manchester museum, which the, it's a natural history museum. Very it's cool, cool place. Yeah. And they have a huge skeleton of a white whale on the ceiling. So just above my piano was this amazing thing. And then I started talking to the curator that was there. I just asked him things about the display just because I was interested. So yeah. I, I had no hidden agenda or anything. I wasn't trying to pitch. And then uh, he started talking about the, the voices the, that, that the whales make. And then I started thinking, oh, maybe I could do something with whales. And then I asked him, like, would you like to do a brainstorming session and just talk about what we could do with whales? And somehow that evolved, cut to six months later, to an entire project that we're doing with collaboration with three different museums. So the Manchester Museum, uh, the Stockholm Natural History, uh, History Museum, and a Maastricht University, and they also have a natural history department. And we're going to do, I, I, I'm composing a program that is about the sustainability of the way that we treat endangered species. So the instruments are actually the skeletons, uh, the instruments that are being played are stripped to their skeletons and we are showing what um, uh, what the similarity will be when an endangered species will become a skeleton. So we're that using the skeletons from the display. And <laughs> so like, then you have this coming out of such a ra random conversation where you have listened to someone else. If I wouldn't have listened, this wouldn't be the case now. I wouldn't have that project, which is amazing to me to do. So, <laughs> I'm You're so creative. That. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, congrats. I really enjoy it. I'm sure that's again, it comes to like finding deeper meaning in what you're doing. And like, that's your connection. It's connection to a, a much, probably a wider audience than what you already yeah. have. And they're going to latch on to what you do and know that you do interesting projects. It's amazing. And it's a completely different project than what I would do normally. It's yeah. totally not my comfort zone. And somehow in a way it throws me into the realm of being an all round artists and not only a musician because there is a visual aspect. So we're using a lot of visuals, audio visual, uh, let's say uh, installation even in, in this project. So there's a whole room that is being designed and this is my first encounter with making something like that. And I'm kind of discovering what I can do because I didn't know I could do that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an amazing experience. That's incredible. Good for you. It's you being responsive to your environment as much as it's responding to you. It's beautiful. Thank you. It's uh, uh yeah, it's it's really it's really good to be in that position cuz I guess if you only see yourself, it's uh, becoming very narrow after a while. Yeah. That's why it's not as fun it's to play by yourself. Fun. Yes. Come play with me. Well, I can't go anywhere right now. I'm not, they're not even going to let me in. Yeah. God, it's uh, insane what is going on. I'm sure. so used to having flights <laughs> like three times a week. Yeah. And then now I'm cut off. Yeah. We've all been put in timeout. So do you have any topics that you would like to discuss? Any subjects? I don't know. You've covered a good range of topics. Everything that I would hit, you've hit. Really? Yeah. That's good. Social, environment. Yeah. Women. All that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So then we go, go on to the fun part of the interview. In that okay. Case. Yes. So there is... um. I don't know if you used to watch the actor's studio, mm -hmm. you know, James Lipton. Yeah. So he was always finishing his uh, conversations with the 10 questions from the Bernard Pivot questionnaire. Okay. And I thought it would be a nice gesture to do that on my podcast as well. So until now I've asked all my guests these 10 questions and basically they're kind of fun 
personal questions and you're supposed to react with the first thing that comes to mind. But if you have two answers, it's also fine. You know, you could okay. elaborate. Okay. Feel free to say whatever you like. Okay, so what is your favorite word? Oh Lord. <laughs> Symbiotic. I don't know if that's actually my nice. favorite word, but it's the first one that came to me. Did you did you study biology? I did not, but I do like nature. And I think it's uh that's what we're all going for, and it's when we're, we're disrupting that that we end up in you know, bad situations. Hmm. And what is your least favorite word? Nauseous. <laughs> yes, I, I dig that. <laughs> it sounds like what it is. It's terrible. It's, it's onomatopoeia. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Yeah. I remember when I heard that word in English, I was thinking like, oh, it does resemble what it means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really does. Yeah. Awesome. Um, what turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Well, music. Uh, people getting excited and responding to like similar things or things that like adding to a conversation and like getting excited about the topic. Uh, so, like whether that's musically or, you know, in conversations. Yeah. I mean, I guess that also makes sense in other like physical intimacy too, but you know, it all, it's all translates. Sure. Yeah. It basically means you like the bunny hop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> People behaving like animals to music. Yeah. Sign me up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What turns you off? Mm, well, people who don't consider others, people who are avoidant, people who don't care. Yeah. I must identify with the last one, people who don't care. And apathy also turns me off. Apathy. Oh, yeah. Perfect word. Yeah. 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 On my OKCupid profile, like there's like, what are the things that turn you off most? And apathy is definitely the thing that I, I put in that column. I want to read that. I haven't looked at it. I mean, since the pandemic hit, I'm like, I'm obviously not going to meet anybody right now because I don't trust anybody. I, only, yeah, I, exactly. I barely trust my friends right now. Like if I know that my friends have not been interacting with people, then I'll hang out with them. But if they've been kind of sort of hanging out with a lot of people, no go. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not going there. I don't, I don't trust it. I'm not trying to get COVID. Do you wear masks on the street? So people only wear masks on public transit. Yeah. That's the only place when it's obliged and they, you're not obliged to wear them inside shops and not on the street. Of course. So, but in a way, miraculously, uh, there are not a lot of cases here. Yeah. So it's not to compare with what's happening in the States. Unfortunately, I mean, like you guys had, I think you were struck the hardest, right? I mean, it was, again, apathy that created the remember, situation remember that we're in. Well, people were not responding to. No, they don't believe that's even a crisis until they get it. Like a lot of people thought it was made up. Mm. I mean, not here, not outside of DC. In this area, people believe it. They wore their masks mm. and it went down. Like we're okay right now, but like the whole South, none of them believed it. They think God they're in God's hands. They don't want to wear a mask because it infringes on their rights and they're in really bad shape. I saw some really disturbing videos of some dudes saying like, yeah, the mouth is intended for breathing. So you're not supposed to cover it with a mask. And I was like, yeah. What about doctors? <laughs> Like they have been using masks for years. Right. So you, would you like your doctor not to wear a mask? Right. While they're giving you surgery? I don't know. Think about what you're saying, man. Mm, they don't care. My friend yeah. the other day was like, yeah, I mean, I just, I just don't even understand, to be honest. Like, I, it's like, I can't get my brain to understand, but you know, they don't want to spend money on education. They don't want to, you know, so it's, it's all focused on making money. So they don't care if they lose people, if they make money 
and they don't believe in science because it means that they can't make as much money if they follow it. So I have some thoughts about that, but let's not get into it. Uh, what is your favorite curse word? I mean, I don't know. I guess fuck. I guess fuck, but I don't know if I have a favorite. I try not to cuss too much, but I do end up saying fuck a lot. I, I don't What's your favorite curse word? I do. Um, it's funny. It's both fuck and Jesus. Sometimes they come yeah. together. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. then I, I better not be around believers at the time. And that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. It, especially when a Jew is saying Jesus, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's flamboyant. <laughs> That's a good word too. What are your favorite words? People. I don't like this one-sided thing. I want to know your answers too. Okay. Yeah, What's ask your me. Favorite please. word. My favorite word is hoopsasa. <laughs> that mean? Hoopsasa. It means like um, like nonsense. Hoopsasa. Yeah. I like that. It's in Bulgarian. They also have glopusti, which is also it also means nonsense. I also like that word. I love it. Okay. What other questions did you ask me? I asked you what was your least favorite word? Yes. My least favorite word. Uh, racism. Yeah. Like the word racism yeah. or what it means? What it means. Definitely. Yeah. Like, uh, I have an allergy for that. It's, yeah. uh, I don't know if you know about the, the whole Dutch uh, holiday thing that they appealed to Terrible. the UNESCO fund. Do you know that thing? I didn't know about the so UNESCO part, to... but it's about that. It's like Santa's a black man kind of thing, and it's super racist, and people dress it's up in black face. Yeah. Yeah, they, they have, like, black schmink on their face. It's like blackface, really. And they applied to the UNESCO uh, lists of um, like intangible heritage to include that holiday as a part of intangible Dutch culture. No. And then, I mean, are you serious? I mean, like you might as well sh shut your mouth about that. Like don't go to UNESCO. They're going to cancel your holiday for sure. Yeah. So now there's a lot of debate here about that. And it strikes me that so many people that I consider uh, intelligent just tell me things like oh we don't mean it as racist so it's not racist okay that's what they say in america do they really want to be really? like this? oh yeah yes it's the same breed do you tell them like you sound so american right now no but i would i would know american in the bad way yeah well they don't like the americans here so good well tell them i think they, they, like, will, oh, they will understand the connotation yeah yeah but like they really don't get it they really really don't get it and they get upset with you for bringing it up like the first time i saw it really saw it in daylight when it was happening i really thought it was like slavery memorial day because they oh. what they do is that they bring the there is like a procession of boats and they go through the canals and there is one white dude with a beard that looks like santa claus it's center class. It's like the origin of Santa in a way. And he stands at the mast. And then behind him, there's like 50 white people with black makeup on their face. And like the whole thing, you know, like with the weird wig and the huge lips and, and dressed like they are the clown gesture. And, um, and there's like 50 boats, 70 boats. I don't know, a lot of boats. And they're old with like 20 to 50 people that are dressed like that. And there's one one white dude that is leading the procession. And they're thinking like, oh, this is probably uh, uh, liberation of Suriname or something. Yeah. You know, like not, I didn't realize. So then I called a friend of mine and I asked her what is going on on the street. And she's like, oh, it's a party for the children. It's so nice. I was like, yeah, no, I mean, what is going in the boats? Yeah, this is a Svarta Piet, Black Piet. I was like, yeah, but why do you have Black Piet? Is that something to do with slavery? And she's like, yeah, he's black because it's going down the chimney. Houston, we have a problem. There's no they don't way. Get it. Really, they don't. I really don't think that that's how that... They might have been told as kids that's how it originated, but I would bet mm -hmm. money that it has more of a connection to slavery somehow. Oh, yeah. They've forgotten. If you look at the... 
if you look at the cartoons, like from the beginning of the century, you can see that this black Pete is connected to a chain. Why is he connected to a chain if he's not a slave? Horrible. Well, I'm sorry. Yeah. There at Holiday is going down the toilet. Yeah. Well, they're not taking it very well. There was this actor, a Dutch actor, a black actor. He did a, a protest thing and he went uh, in uh, in Utrecht, one of the biggest cities here. Uh, he dressed up as, as Santa Claus as a black man and he was riding a white horse and he entered the city the way that the normal center class would enter the city. And he got such a backlash of horrible comments. They took photos on the street. I saw it in like Het Parole, one of the biggest newspapers. And you could see people's faces contorted with anger when they saw him. And you think like, oh, wow, this is rooted really deep in the culture. This is not, it's, we're not uh, dealing with trifles here. It's like really, it's serious business. Wow. Well, they're racist. Mm -hmm. I thought you were better. Dutch, but you're not. Well, I don't know. We're all racist. The thing is, that how how do we deal with it? How much do we let it affect us? If we, I, I don't think that there is any person that hasn't been dealing with inner racism at least once in their lives. Yeah. Because you're being brought up in a certain way, or you have yeah. a certain reaction that you that you're yeah that you're used to. But the question is, is how do you deal with it? Exactly. The problem of, as a society is that we don't take responsibility. We don't say we have a problem with, with racism. We say they have a problem with racism. They are bad. And, and anything else, it's not uh, any problem. We blame it on someone else. There's always a scapegoat. So once you don't, don't take responsibility, it will not be solved. Exactly. Um, so what sound or noise do you love? I love... The wind going through the trees, like those are some of my favorite sounds. Hmm. What about you? And what's that? Mm, there are so many things. It's very difficult to choose one. I love the oboe. I love the piano. <laughs> uh, and, and I love voices. Um, a good baritone would do it for me. For oh, sure. there you go. Yeah. Nice. Uh, Freddie Mercury is probably, yeah, Freddie Mercury oh, is my yeah. favorite sound. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, and I don't know, generally sounds, I, I don't like sounds so much. Like, But that's my next question. What sound or noise do you hate? The piccolo. I hate the piccolo. Really? Yeah. It, it drives me crazy. I played the, I started as a flute player. I wasn't crazy about the flute. Oh. I, I'm still not crazy about the flute. Uh, but I like it much more than I like a piccolo. It's the most irritating sound in the world. I guess another sound that I really do like is like the dome of a cymbal. I love that clang. I hate that too. You hate that? I like that. The dome? No, it's the best part. I hate. Oh, the, oh, the dome. I thought you yeah. meant the clash. The no. dome of the cymbal. The clash I hate. The clang. It's so yeah. good. Like the ride. Uh, the ride the jazz. Cool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I like a yeah. sizzle cymbal a lot. Uh, what do I not like? I'm not a huge fan of clarinet either. Woodwinds, man. I like saxophones. Uh, I hope I you like, like trombones. The oboe's cool. Oboe's cool. The same cool. You know, they have super unique sounds and they always show up in like these really interesting like spaces. So I like that. Hmm. I don't like horns. Or sirens. Uh, I don't know that this is, well, yeah, I guess. I've never heard the sound of a tornado, but I already can tell you I don't like it. It's probably my least favorite sound. Okay. I'm most paranoid. My biggest I, I never heard it either. Is tornadoes. They come out of nowhere. Really? So scary, yeah. But do, do you have them in D.C.? No. Well, we get threats sometimes. Mm. We've never, I've never, mm. luckily I've never seen one or experienced it. Mm. I've seen the aftermath through trees. Wow. I'm not messing around with it. Sounds scary. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? I don't like the, I don't like the sound of uh, doing the dishes. Like all the clunk, 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 clunk. <laughs> yeah, that's a bad sound. 
if I have to do the dishes, I put earplugs on and then on top of them, my noise canceling headphones and I'm playing music at the same time, just <laughs> able, listening to that. Yeah, there you go. That's hilarious. Yeah. yeah. Profession other than your own, would you like to attempt? I don't know about attempt, but in my other life, I would have been a backup singer because you can travel mm. with the rock stars and you get the rock star life, but you don't have to deal with any of like the drama. So I'm all about that. Mm. I'd like to be on the road, but not be a front person and not work. You know, I just want to play. Actually, I guess the drummer is kind of that same kind of thing. Nobody really knows who the drummer is most of the time. What about you? You've already done all kinds of professions. Yes. Um, I think if I weren't a musician, I would be a doctor. Mm. I also, not a lot of people know that, but I studied medicine before I studied music for three years. I never finished my degree, but um, I was very interested hmm. in medicine. What happened? The, the road music was you? a calling. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I couldn't deny it anymore, so. That's awesome. Yeah. That's when you know that you really should be there, you know? Yeah. I tried to get away, it didn't work. How did you try to get away? By studying something else. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, yes. well, you could go back to it if you want. I was thinking, want. yeah, I'll keep it as a hobby. Mm -mm. I'm sure it comes in handy, though. Yeah, it's it's good. Uh, you don't have to go to the doctor a lot. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. And you like when things happen, you know that it's not life threatening, even if it is something that looks really serious. So I guess it gives you perspective, which is good. That is good. And you know what to do. Like if so, something happens to someone else. I've been in situations like that before. And then you just have to react. And some you really help someone when you do that so good for you uh, it's amazing that you can do it yeah i'm That's grateful great. for uh having learned these some of these skills i don't know everything but uh, some good for you mm. what else so what what profession other than your own you would not like to do doctor i'm not into the the medical arena. I get skeemish no. around blood. So none of that, no nurse, no doctor, none of that would have been for me. Uh, yeah. If I didn't go into music at all, I would have probably become like an environmental scientist or a naturalist That's or fun. biologist or something that dealt with nature. Either way, I, I would not make that money. Well, oh, yeah, it's not about the money, right? These right. these things are passions. Exactly. If I would be here for the money, I would not do the music that I'm doing. <laughs> I would make something completely different. Cover bands. Yeah, Billie Eilish, you know, like I yeah. would go that, that direction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I would like to be a politician. I think that's mm. a horrible life. Yeah. Do people have to be so terrible, though? I don't think you have to, but you have to deal with a lot of people who are terrible. Yeah. And I think that I would just get a heart attack once a year because I would be dealing with people that I really don't like and uh, would would give me the trots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get that. I wouldn't want to do that either. I'm not a schmoozer. Mm. I just want to care about the thing and mm. do good work. My last question is actually the best question, or at least one of the best questions. Um, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you pass the pearly gates? <sighs> you made a difference. You made wow. the world better by existing. You are loved. Uh, something of that nature. You did a good job and you're loved. 
I could say, I could say that to you right now. You you are doing a good job and you are loved. Thank you. Yeah. What about you? Yeah. Um I think I would like to hear um this is your time to let go. Ah. That is also an issue one. with that. Yeah. Well, you're being you forced to, to let go. Responsibility for everything. Huh? You're being forced to let go right now. Oh, I like that. Please let me do that. <laughs> I'm not very good at that. I am, um, I'm fantasizing about it, but I'm still learning. <laughs> I take responsibility for way too many things. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've noticed that about you. Really? Yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah. It's so in, yeah, embedded in, how hard you work and you don't want to slow down. Have you ever tried like meditation or yoga or anything? Oh yeah. Uh, I do a lot of yoga. Well, I did, I don't do it anymore. Uh, but I did a lot of yoga and I liked it. Uh, but I, I was doing Ashtanga yoga, which is like the dynamic yoga that you Ooh. do move. So like sitting Ooh. down and doing stretches for 20 minutes is not for me. Yeah. But uh, like one stretch, you know? Yeah. But like the dynamic one that has, that you do as like the asana, like you, it's almost like Tai Chi that you have like this whole yeah. procession of movements. I like that. Yeah. And I, meditation does not work for me at all because um, I, yeah, first of all, I can't sit for such a long time physically. I just can't mm -hmm. do it. So if it's a walking meditation, it's fine. There you go. And also, it's hard for me to stop thinking. So I, I just keep on thinking. Yeah. That's the practice. So some things that I have to practice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the, yeah, that's the trick about meditation is you have to stop your mind or notice when you're thinking yeah. and go back to stopping your mind. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard. So I don't know if it is for me, but for instance, when I do other things, when I play music, then I feel like I'm meditating because I'm not thinking anymore. I'm in the zone. And yeah. uh, also when I play certain types of sports, uh, it's also something that nobody knows that I'm fencing. I'm doing fencing. No way. And yes. <laughs> for some reason, it really doesn't like surprise that. me. Sorry? It doesn't surprise me for some reason. No. I can see you as a good fencer. And, and I really like it. It's um, because when I play the game, I'm well, I'm not good at it at all. Right. I'm not I'm not winning or anything. Yeah. But when I play the game. It's really like meditation. I don't think about anything. I'm just existing. You're and focused on the one thing. Yeah, it's taking away my the reflex of thinking and taking responsibility and doing stuff like that. So I enjoy it very much um, just being, and I can do, I can achieve that through playing music and through fencing. So these are my meditations. Yeah, that's great. Um, hiking is mine for mm -hmm. sure. Same thing. I, get oh, I love hiking. Hand. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. let's go on a hike. That yeah. Be fun. I would love it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I did the Camino de Santiago. I don't know if you know it. It's a trail in Spain. Ah, to the whole, does it go all the way to the Holy Land? Is that the thing? Or what is it? I don't know. Yeah. Well, there are some, a lot of versions of it that start in other countries as well, but we basically walked from Pamplona. So that's very close to the French border mm -hmm. and until Galicia. So, um, you know, uh, uh, Santiago de Compostela where Womex was. Yeah. Uh, so that we walked from Pamplona to Santiago and it was a long walk. It's one month, but it's totally worth it. It's that's really amazing. nice. Yeah. I would totally do it. It's awesome. Come on, let's do it. If I had a month, I know. Yeah, I mean, basically yeah. I need to like detach here and then go do stuff. I did do it in two parts because I, did, I didn't have a month. So mm -hmm. I went one time for two weeks and one time for three weeks and then I combined it. But, uh, but at least I walked. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. Cool. You're such an awesome guest. Thank, Thank you. So you. You're an awesome host. Yay. Yay. Thank you. Thank you so much for being a part of this. 
So uh, my I'm pleasure. wishing you a lot, a lot of, a lot of great things, not only for DC, but also, yeah, well, for the entire world, but also for your own little bubble there. They will continue to expand and, um, like, you know, put all the good in the world that is already doing, but more. Thank you. Thank you. Continue to be you. one of the good ones. Yeah. Trying. Yeah. Bye. Talk to you soon. Bye. Talk to you soon. So thank you so much for joining us today. As you know, YDIY Music offers scholarships for independent musicians. So to register, please visit ydiymusic.com slash scholarship and submit the application form. All donations for this podcast will be used to help young musicians get a proper education. So please visit ydiymusic.com slash donate to make your contribution. And you could also send a direct PayPal transfer to paypal.me slash Noam Vazana. Join me next week, Thursday, July 23rd, as I'll be interviewing Gunhild Carling from Sweden. She is an international brass sensation and one of my favorite musicians. In the meantime, good luck, keep calm, and DIY. <laughs>